So the book is Good Energy. I'll start there. It's an amazing book. Congratulations. And you start the book with a really powerful story, the story of losing your mom tragically and rapidly to pancreatic cancer three years ago. So can you start there and walk us through what happened? Mm, absolutely. I think, you know, my mother's story is almost like an archetype for what I think so many Americans are dealing with today or heading into. And so I'll share her story briefly because I think a lot of you will be able to recognize uh, themselves in it and just this culture we have in medicine of really missing the warning signs. When my mom was about 40, she had me. I was an almost 12 pound baby. Whoa, 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 whoa. 12 pounds at birth. Wow. I was 11 pounds, nine ounces. Very close to 12 pounds. Wow. You know, and of course, the vibe was like, congratulations, you had this big, healthy baby, you know, no mention of what that could potentially mean as a problem for her and me. But she goes into her 40s. She has a lot of trouble losing the baby weight. She had put on about 75 pounds when she had me. Very difficult to lose it. Uh, she goes into her late 40s, perimenopause, really tough menopause, tons of hot flashes, sleep disturbances, the works. She gets into her 50s and like so many Americans, it's just like, you know, one thing after another, like the treadmill of American life. It's high cholesterol. Here's a statin. High blood pressure. Here's an ACE inhibitor. Oh, your blood sugar's creeping up. Here's metformin. You know, these are medications that are prescribed literally hundreds of millions of times per year. The statin, 200 million times. Metformin, 90 million times. And so the vibe with the doctor being very much like, this is very normal. We have good medications for this. And my mom was just absolutely diligent about seeing all her specialists and taking her medications. And then flash forward, she's 72. She's taking a hike with my dad like they did every evening on the coast near their ho home in Northern California. And she gets this terrible pain in her belly. And it's unusual for her. And she has to sit down on the hike. And it lasts for a couple of days. So she calls her primary care doctor and they say, you know, this is pretty unusual to have really bad stomach pain for three days. Let's get a CT scan. So she goes in, gets a CT scan, and later that day, she gets a text message to her phone that says stage four widely metastatic pancreatic cancer with baseball size tumors all throughout her abdomen. And 13 days later, not even a phone call, a text. Yeah. And 13 days later, she was dead. And so. <laughs> You know, through <laughs> the part that really just, I mean, I think evangelized me and my brother to write this book is that the doctors that she was seeing at the time were what people would consider the best in the world. She was being seen at Stanford and Palo Alto Medical Foundation. She was getting executive physicals at Mayo Clinic. And they looked us in the eye at the time of her diagnosis and death, and they said, oh, my God. This is so unlucky. And, you know, I think that that's really what we're trying to unpack here. Like, was it unlucky? Certainly through the conventional Western framework that we look at symptoms and disease, of course, it kind of seems unlucky. She's got all these random things. She, you know, had the big baby and she was a little overweight after, after you know, having babies and then bad menopause and high cholesterol, high blood pressure, high, high blood sugar, and then cancer. Seems like all these different siloed things. But when you actually dig deeper and put on the sort of goggles of connection of how these all these conditions she had throughout her life from age late 30s on were related, what you find is that every single one of them is completely and fundamentally rooted in metabolic dysfunction, mitochondrial dysfunction. And through that lens, which we are absolutely not trained in at all in the Western medical system, which is focused on reactive whack-a-mole symptom managed medicine, symptom management medicine, you just don't see these connections. And so if we had a different framework, if we had a framework that truly looked at the root cause physiology of disease rather than just identifying diseases as symptoms and collections of symptoms that all seem very different, we would be able to help people so much earlier. So that is what really put my brother Callie and I on a warpath to help get this message into the world of metabolic dysfunction or bad energy as the root cause of almost every disease we're facing in the modern Western world today that the healthcare system completely ignores. And, you know, it really is the, the sort of 
dark and herring part of it is that the way the system is fundamentally funded, you know, the system which is the largest business in the United States, the healthcare system, it is not only the largest system, but it is the fastest growing system in the United States. It's predicated on keeping us in this sort of blinded framework of diseases being very separate things. Because what happens when you have eight diseases? You're seeing eight specialists. You're on eight medications. You might be getting eight different procedures. That's our conventional system. That is highly profitable. Versus if you're looking at the root cause connections, it's very possible that you might have to do much less to get a very widespread benefit because you're focusing on the core connected physiology. And so, you know, my wish for everyone is to understand that there is a different way to look at these, these things that are causing our suffering in, in the modern world today that is very empowering, that's focused on cultivating what I call good energy in our cells, which is metabolic health. It's the way that our cells fundamentally power ourselves. We determine this through our dietary and lifestyle choices. And when we can actually fundamentally create metabolic health in our lives, our risk of all of these diseases, everything my mom dealt with and so many other conditions is just drastically reduced. And the system, unfortunately, is not going to move there very quickly because it's predicated on on siloing as part of its business model, which unfortunately is an invisible hand that dictates all aspects of our medical education, our research, and our guidelines as physicians. Yes, so much to unpack there. You know, I, I think of pancreatic cancer, and I think that one scares the hell out of many people because uh, unfortunately the symptoms tend to show up at the very late stages in your mom's case. And, and, and you know, Steve Jobs and their whole host of people have succumbed to pancre pancreatic cancer and, and there's not much you can do, you know, that that's one of the reasons I recently did my Pernovo scan clean. And, and I think we're entering this age where there are diagnostics where you can get ahead. Cause if you catch, you know, we're not doing like cancer rates are increasing at an alarming rate there. We have, I'm sure we both have hypotheses of what's going on there. So cancer is increasing treatments like, okay, maybe a little better, but in some of these specific cancers like pancreatic, there's a lot you can do early, but not much you can do late. So it's one thought I had. The other thought, you know, in, in, in thinking of your mom, it was like this slippery slope that so many people experience. So you, you maybe hear like, oh, I got like a case of the forties where, you know, a little bit overweight, a little bit lethargic. Okay, now I'm just going to have one medication. No big deal. Doctor doesn't make it a big deal. So why should it be a, a big deal? Right. What I am excited about and, and a big message of you and your brother, Callie, and your work is empowerment. And you have to be the own CEO of your health. And you've got to ask questions. And I'm going to segue to metabolic health because I think this is a place where everyone should start given, what is it, 92%? of Americans are metabolic. It was 88%. Now it's like 92% are metabolically unhealthy. 93.2%. 93 keeps on going up. Oof. Yeah. And so can we start there and can you give a primer on metabolic health more specifically that the markers that everyone should have on their radar and everyone's going to want to take, take, take a minute and take, take it, take note the markers and where ideally you should be? Because I think everyone should start here with their primary care physician. Based on our latest research in large-scale population studies, only 6.8% of American adults are metabolically optimized. And this is absolutely astonishing because it is underlying almost every leading cause of premature death in the United States and so many of the symptoms that ail us. And I think the big message I want people to understand about metabolic health is it's actually quite simple. Metabolism is how we convert food energy into cellular energy to power every aspect of our lives. We have 40 trillion plus cells in the body, and every single one of those 40 trillion cells is doing trillions of chemical reactions per second. And the bubbling up of all those chemical reactions is what we call life. That's who we are. That's our feelings, our emotions, our ability to move, our consciousness, everything. Every single one of those chemical reactions requires cellular energy in order to occur. And currently in the US, 93.2% of Americans are having trouble with that food to energy conversion process. And it's actually such a, such a miraculous process when you think about it, because 
fundamentally what we're doing when we say food energy to cellular energy is we're taking this like potential energy essentially from the cosmos, from the environment. And it truly is from the cosmos because the food energy is actually the sun's energy coming 92 million miles through space, reacting with the chloroplasts of plants like we learned about in high school biology. And that sun's energy is essentially being stored in the carbon-carbon bonds of plants, which we either eat or animals eat, and then we eat the animals. So then in our cells, in our mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cells, we literally liberate and unlock the sun's energy and convert it to a currency, like a coin, that we can pay for all of these trillions of chemical reactions that are happening every single second that bubble up to make our lives. And that process of liberating this potential cosmic energy into human energy to fuel our consciousness is broken. And it's broken in very recent history. And it's broken because the pace of change of our environment Every aspect of our modern lives has changed astronomically faster than in ever in human history just in the past hundred years. Everything from the amount of sleep we're getting, what we're eating, how we're eating, the way we're moving or not moving, the way we are having to absorb so much stressful information all the time, the synthetic toxins in our food, water, air, and home products, the way we're interacting with light, less sunlight, more artificial light, and even temperature, how we're interacting with temperature. We're in this very thermoneutral existence. All of those things directly and uniquely and synergistically impact negatively the mitochondria, which liberates energy for our bodies to function. And so what's happening is that we've got underpowered cells because of the confluence of factors that are damaging our mitochondria. So what happens when you have underpowered cells, which is metabolic dysfunction or bad energy? Well, we have over 200 cell types in the body, all these different types of cells that do different things. We've got brain cells like astrocytes and glial cells and neurons. We've got kidney cells. We've got hepatic liver cells. We've got ovarian theca cells. We've got endothelial cells lying in the blood vessels of the heart and the brain and the penis and the retina. We've got all these different types of cells. And underpowering in different cell types looks like different symptoms and diseases. But just because the manifestation of underpowering in those cell types looks different on a symptom level doesn't necessarily mean that what's causing those symptoms is actually different. And what we're realizing now and the real unlock that we have to internalize as a healthcare system individuals is that that core fundamental problem of mitochondrial dysfunction is the root cause of so many of these seemingly disparate diseases we're seeing which are simply the downstream manifestations of underpowering, bad energy, mitochondrial dysfunction, metabolic dysfunction in different cell types. So then the question everyone's going to have is, how do I know if I have bad energy? How do I know if I have this problem that's affecting people? So there are five basic key biomarkers that can help you start to understand where you are on this good energy, bad energy spectrum. And they are generally free on your annual physical, and they include fasting glucose, triglycerides, HDL cholesterol, waist circumference, and blood pressure. So to meet the criteria of essentially metabolically optimized, we want to see fasting glucose under 100 milligrams per deciliter, triglycerides under 150 milligrams per deciliter, HDL above 40 for men or 50 for women, blood pressure less than 130 over 85, although some sources will say lower than 120 over 80, and a waist circumference less than 35 inches in women and 40 inches in men. So pull out your health records from last year, listen to that again, and see where you stand. Um, and and if all of those are in the, you know, what they consider to be optimal range, not on medication, you're part of that very small percentage of Americans who uh, are metabolically healthy. And so these these biomarkers, these lab tests and these signs like waist circumference and blood pressure, they are essentially um, readouts that can tell us a bit about what's happening deeper inside the cell. And they are a signal to us that something 
is working or is struggling with those internal mitochondrial processes. So that's why those biomarkers are valuable. But that 6.8% could easily go up to 70%, 80%, maybe 100% if we reoriented the entire healthcare conversation on what actually matters, which is creating bodies that have the power to do the work they need to do to generate health. And really, this comes down to a conversation about how do we improve the life force of humanity uh, by addressing the things that are keeping our cells beleaguered and dysfunctional. Yes. And the good news, if you do check all those boxes and you are part of the 6.8%, you're you're most likely in great shape for staving off cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, you, you know, cognitive decline, all the above. You can go more, a whole a lot more extensive with blood work, but you're off to a fantastic start. And if you're not, you know, it's okay. We want to empower you. And the good news is, as you've outlined the book, there's so much you can do with lifestyle and more specifically diet to turn this around quickly. And so can we segue there in the book, you have these amazing six principles of good energy eating. Could you briefly walk us through those principles? Absolutely. So what we're presenting in the book is an extremely non-dogmatic approach to eating that focuses on what I call a matching problem. We have cells that are like little cities. They're little machines, each one of them. And they need certain factors to, to go into them through food in order to function properly. And they can't be overburdened with things that damage them or they're not going to work properly. So if we take that, and, and because of the incredible amount of molecular biology research we have in the world, we pretty much have a really good sense of what the cells do need to function. So our job with eating is to match what the cells need to what we're putting in our body. And that can happen through many different dietary philosophies, different dietary patterns, but we have to be thoughtful about it because fundamentally it's as simple as meeting the cell's needs. So the first principle of good energy eating is that food determines the structure of our cells and our microbiome and the function. And so we <laughs> the, the wild thing is that we take in 70 metric tons of food in our lifetime about two to three pounds a day, one ton per year. And every single day as we're eating, we are essentially re-3D printing our body with the ink being that food. So it is very much the structural element of our body. It The fats in our diet make up our cell membranes. The proteins we eat break down into amino acids and make all the little prote thousands of protein machines that essentially run our lives inside our cells. You know, every little piece of DNA that gets replicated into new cells, that is all coming from food. So we really need to understand that we want the highest quality food possible going into our body so that the majority of that 70 metric tons is filled with the building blocks we need to reconstruct our body, which is happening every single day. Just look at something like the stat that we re- build our entire skin about every 40 days. We remake our entire gut lining every week or so. So we constantly want to be um, choosing food thoughtfully so that we can just continually keep giving the body the ink to print the best version of ourselves of next week, next year, and the future. It's also a very hopeful message because the fact that we are these rapidly turning over transformers, we're not this static body that we think we are. We're actually this really hive of matter that's constantly giving and exchanging matter with the outside world through eating. We have the ability to always heal, right? Because if we can give the body what it needs, we can rebuild a body that's more functional. So that starts with food. It also, all that 70 metric tons, not only is the structural building block, but it's also the chemical messenger that tells our cells what to do. So a lot of these molecules in our food are actually going in and being genetic regulators. They are being cell signaling molecules, constantly communicating with the cell about what to do. So an example of this one that I just absolutely love is curcumin from turmeric. Curcumin is one of the compounds in turmeric that makes it bright yellow, and it literally goes into the cell and turns down the activation of the NF-kappa B genetic pathway and decreases the chronic inflammatory burden inside our bodies. So 
Food is both a functional messenger and a building block. And then, of course, it's also what dictates our microbiome composition and the structure of our microbiome because as we feed the microbiome fiber and polyphenols, two things that they eat, which come from food, we influence them to populate in a way that is really positive for our biology. And when we feed them lots of healthy fiber and polyphenols, they are going to digest those food products and create chemicals that make us have happier, healthier longer lives. So that's just principle number one, which is a framework for thinking about what food actually is so that we can be empowered to make better decisions. And built into that first principle is that food quality really matters because our soil has become so depleted through industrial agriculture practices that really started ramping up after World War II. So very recent phenomena using these heavy industrial practices like tilling and organophosphate pesticides and organophosphate uh, fertilizers, synthetic pesticides, really aggressive manipulation of the soil through both chemicals and physical structures like tilling. And that's really destroyed the microbial life of our soil in the United States. And what that does is it means that without that microbial life in the soil, our food literally is not getting injected with as many nutrients as it did previously. So that 70 metric tons of food we're eating already, just living in America, has less nutrients in it. And the closer we can get to food that came directly out of the soil, it's going to have more nutrients because the nutrient composition essentially declines the longer the food is out of the soil, like if it's being transported from Mexico or Chile or across the country. And secondarily, um, if we can buy food like from farmers who we know are not using synthetic pesticides or industrial practices um, and doing a more um, nor natural form of farming, we actually know that that healthier soil is going to put more nutrients in our food. So um, when we're thinking about, you know, food being both the structural and functional, you know, foundation of our lives, it really, it really makes sense why trying to get food as close to the source is so, so, so important because financially we want more helpful molecules in the body as much as possible. So as our cells are trying to do their work, they can, they can grab you know, they have a higher chance of grabbing something good, you know, from from our bloodstream, essentially, to, to do their work. So that's principle one. Um, and, and, and principle two is that eating is the process of matching cellular needs with oral inputs. And that's really what I've been talking about, that we have these cells that have needs, you know, they need micronutrients, they need certain fatty acids. And fundamentally, our job with eating is to, to meet those needs. And one of the ways you can know if you're meeting the needs of the cell is essentially twofold. One is, do we have symptoms? Because if a cell's needs are not getting met over a long period of time, what are they going to do? They're going to express dysfunction and, and we're going to have symptoms. So the way we understand if we're meeting the needs of the cell through food and other lifestyle factors is we just tune in. Like, how do I feel? So that's one. And the second way we know if we're meeting the cell's needs is we look at our biomarkers. If we are meeting the needs of the cells and not overburdening them with things they don't need that are toxic to them, our biomarkers are going to look really good. And so built into this principle is like, everyone's confused about nutrition. Like research has shown that like close to 80% of people are confused about nutrition. But a real message from this book is like, you don't need to be confused about nutrition. Because if you pursue a consistent pattern, no matter what that is, paleo, vegan, carnivore, keto, whatever, and you're focusing on high quality, unprocessed foods, do that for a few months, check in with your symptoms, check in with your biomarkers. And if they're improving, that's great. Keep going. And if they're not or getting worse, then you probably need to shift gears because you're not meeting the needs of the cell. So we actually do have the ability in this day and age to have a lot of this personal clarity about our diet. But unfortunately, I think we don't have that framework for understanding really how to tune in and know. So that's that's principle one and two. I'll pause there in case there's any questions. But you know, it's I think that um, we can really get past the diet wars by really just focusing on what fundamentally matters for our diet. Yeah, yes, yeah, agreed. We're all individuals. And I, I love your approach. How do, how do you feel after eating? And then also check in with your your markers, see how your body's responding. Something I've learned over the course of time with testing, and I, my listeners are probably sick of me saying this, is I'm a hyper absorber 
of saturated fat. And so my PSA is I'm better off eating a lean cut of high quality meat than I am coconut milk. Wow. So you can't tell me that any diet is specifically better than another one. And I've learned this through testing and, and, and experience. Um, and something else I want to call out, you know, I, I, I love the approach. We're all unique, figure out what works. Something that works for, I think, pretty much everyone, I'm going to generalize here, is the importance of high quality protein as it relates to energy and, and muscle, which comes along with high quality protein and resistance training. And why, in your view, why are protein and muscle so key in, in balancing our energy and how they protect us from all of the things we don't want. This question really gets into principle number four, which is that extreme food cravings are a sign from your body that you are giving it mixed messages. And this ties into protein because protein is one of the pieces of information that we put into our body that communicates with the nutrient sensing cells of our body that allow them to stimulate hormones that tell us that we don't need to eat more, that we are full, that we are satiated. And so when we have food cravings and we're constantly hungry, I, I would like to propose a new framework for that, which is that it's essentially that we're not giving the body the nutrient profile that it needs to know that you have had enough food. So it's our job to communicate with the body with different nutrients to essentially stimulate the cells, these nutrient sensing cells of the gut to produce the hormones and the chemicals that make us feel full. So we can, one of the key ways that we do that is through proteins and amino acids. And it's really fascinating how it ties into the Ozempic and GLP-1 conversation, the GLP-1 agonist conversation, because fundamentally the, the GLP-1 uh, producing cells of the body are nutrient sensing cells that will produce your own GLP-1, your own sort of natural Ozempic, when they know that there's enough amino acids and proteins around. Fiber also impacts those nutrient sensing cells. So if we can give the body more of that, we can become our own pharmacy of this hormone that tells us that we don't need to eat more, which is why, like, you know, love Gabrielle Lyons and her incredible book, Forever Strong. She says we really should focus on trying to get 30 grams of protein per meal because that is essentially communicating with your cells that you've had a good amount of food and we don't need to eat much more. Of course, protein also is a communication strategy uh, with our muscles to for, for anabolic growth to actually keep the muscles built and keep them strong and to grow. And muscle then goes on to be this incredible organ in the body that secretes its own hormones that keep us healthy, that promote longevity, that reduce chronic inflammation. And so, so protein really is, I like to think of almost everything we eat as words that we're speaking to ourselves with. And when we eat protein, what we're saying to the body is, you're full, we've had enough food, and you don't need to eat much more. And when we're missing um, protein, or we're missing micronutrients, when we are missing key elements that the body needs to function, the body will essentially through hormones, tell you to keep eating until it gets what it needs. And because our diet is both from poor soil and industrially processed, because almost 70% of our calories are from ultra-processed foods, our food have so little value in them that of course the body is driving us to be insatiably hungry because it's desperate for us to actually give it what it needs. And this is why we are literally the only species in the world that's eating itself to death because we're not giving the body what it needs. We're giving those mixed signals. So this is why real food, 
whole food, protein-rich food from good soil that's not processed is so important because it's more words to the body that says you've got what you need. So that's that's those are those are my thoughts on protein. And I would just add one more thing, Jason, which is that there's other ways we communicate with the body. And of course, one of the things that I think a lot about is glucose spikes. And we talk a lot about satiety and protein because it's such an amazing nutrient that helps these nutrient sense- sensing cells know to secrete satiety hormones. But there's this other layer to hunger that I think is so fascinating, which is that when we when we eat refined carbohydrates, refined sugars, and have that large glucose excursion, the big glucose spike, that's often followed with a big glucose crash. So the magnitude of the spike often mirrors the extent of a crash after that because the body is responding to a big glucose spike, secretes all this insulin to soak up the glucose out of the bloodstream, and then that often leads to this like overcompensatory crash. And interestingly, uh, a study from Nature, one of the premier medical journals just about a year or two years ago, showed that it's actually the extent of the glucose crash that determines how hungry we're going to be later in the day and how much we're going to crave carbohydrates. And it makes sense. If your glucose is plummeting, that's a very scary signal for the body and your body wants to bring it back up to baseline. So this is why having like a big glucose spike in the morning with a big crash is going to essentially set you up for the entire day to be wanting carbohydrates and be hungry and to eat more calories. And the extent of that crash is predictive of how much you're going to consume. So when we take all of these things together, this is why a high protein breakfast with very little glucose spike is going to absolutely be the best thing you can do to set yourself up for a day of really healthy eating patterns where we're not overeating and we feel that natural satiety that comes from communicating with our body uh, in a really clear way. So I I love that. One thing I want to call out is the advantage of building muscle too is that it acts as a protective layer here. You know, as we think about, you know, the glucose spikes, like the more, if if we, as a culture, step back and I think we're conflating weight loss with loss of fat and we're better served rather than saying to oneself, and I I take exception, people need to lose maybe hundreds of pounds, different ballpark, but we're talking for groups, maybe like 10, 20, 30 pounds. It's not, I need to lose weight. A better way to think about this is I I maybe need to to gain lean muscle mass because that's going to be so much more effective in making your body more efficient, producing more of that that good energy, so to speak, being less susceptible to these sport, sorts of spikes you want to avoid. And as a byproduct, you will lose fat, which is really what you want to lose. So I, I think we're better served kind of rethinking that that whole conversation. And I, I want to also, you know, you mentioned, you know, setting yourself up for success in the morning with breakfast. I wholeheartedly agree. What's your go-to breakfast? right now. Well, last time you were on the show, you had a great tip, uh, you know, on, on this very subject. So like, wh- what's your go-to right now to start your morning? I focus on, well, first of all, I I practice some inter- intermittent fasting. So I like to, well, actually, one thing that my partner and I do is that every week, and this might feel a little extreme, but it, it's working for us, is that we we fast from Sunday night after dinner to Tuesday morning. So we actually do a 36-hour fast every week. And Something incredible about that for me, and everybody is different, and I track my symptoms and my biomarkers to know what's working for me and what's not, but it it is this opportunity for our bodies every week to really go into ketosis and to you know, work through <laughs> excess, you know, glycogen that might be built up and and to really put us into that metabolically flexible state where our body is forced to to go into the fat burning mode and, and keep those pathways activated. And of course, also to stimulate mitophagy and autophagy, two things that really help mitochondrial health. And so to me, what that does is it for the entire rest of the week makes me much less hungry in the mornings because my body's just used to to be able to burn fat when I haven't eaten something first thing in the morning. So I've noticed that since I've, and I'm certainly not recommending this to everyone, but since doing this more regular 36-hour fast, like I just 
am not starving when I wake up in the morning because all those pathways to basically flip from glucose burning to fat burning, I think are just more activated. So that's, that's one thing I'll just note. And it's kind of an experiment. Like we're just running an experiment. We've been doing it for several months and it feels good and my biomarkers are good. So I'm continuing with it. And my periods are completely regular every 28 days on the dot. So for me, it works. Certainly not recommending it to everyone. But then on an average day, I'll probably eat around 10 or 11. And I'm eating basically like <laughs> dinner for breakfast, essentially. Like I, I will do, you know, protein and vegetables and avocado and just a very um, like I'll, yesterday at about 11, I had flackers, a can of wild caught salmon, which with a tablespoon of Primal Kitchen's mayo. I mixed in like about a quarter cup of sauerkraut into the tuna salad. And then I had half an avocado. So I was basically having like a deconstructed tuna salad sandwich as sort of like a breakfast lunch around 11 a.m. And that led to zero point glucose elevation. It had about 46 grams of protein between the flax crackers and the tuna. Um, and I felt great for hours. Uh, so protein, no glucose spike. I'll also do some traditional breakfast. I make a lot of frittatas. So frittatas are such an easy way to get tons of vegetables in and lots of protein with the eggs. And they last for days. And so I'll do frittatas with vegetables and then top it with a bunch of sauerkraut to get probiotics. And then I'll just do a lot of simple scrambles. Um, so grass-fed eggs, I'll do bison or venison, ground bison, venison, or lamb, and then a bunch of vegetables in there, garlic, onions, broccoli, and just have a scramble. So usually it's some type of like grass-fed meat, pasture-raised eggs, vegetables, or like a, like a salmon or, or fish or something like that. So th it all aligns with exactly what I lay out in the book, which is essentially a very simple way of thinking about meals, which is we want five things in and we want three things out in essentially every meal. To meet our cellular needs, I believe that it's ideal to have a source of fiber, probiotics, omega-3 fats, antioxidants, and healthy protein in every meal, and to not have refined ultra-processed grains, refined ultra-processed sugars, or refined industrial seed oils. So the way that I think about good energy eating to really meet the needs of the mitochondria in the cell is to just know my favorite sources in each of those categories. So for fiber, you know, I love flax seeds, chia seeds, basil seeds, avocado, raspberries, hemp seeds, for beans, legumes. For omega-3s, I love mackerel, sardines, tuna, flax seeds, hemp seeds, chia seeds, basil seeds. For probiotics, I really love sauerkraut. That's my favorite. I like kvass, which is an unsweetened type of kombucha. I like miso. Uh, for protein, of course, it's eggs, game meats, beans, legumes. Um, and for antioxidants, it's basically like every colorful fruit and vegetable, plus spices, teas, coffee, cocoa, and certainly antioxidants and nuts and seeds as well. So I sort of have these components in my kitchen at all times, all within arm's reach, canned salmon, sauerkraut in the fridge, basil seeds on the counter. And eating becomes very like modularized. Like it's very second nature of whatever I'm eating, I'm going to grab a little bit of each of those things. And then of course, eliminate the refined grain sugars and seed oils. And when that becomes second nature, like how to build any meal with those five components for, for me, and certainly from what I've seen in the research and what I present in Good Energy, that is a very simple way to get closer to meeting your cell's needs every day with food. So you look at that tuna sandwich I just talked about, and it's like, we've got the fiber with the flax crackers and the avocado. We've got the protein with the salmon and the flax crackers. We've got the probiotics with the sauerkraut. We've got the antioxidants and basically everything but the salmon. And we've got the omega-3s with the flax crackers and the salmon. So it's just so second nature to do that. So my, my call to action in the book is for everyone to really like internalize their favorite sources of each of those five things in the good energy eating plan. And then just, you know, make sure those, those get incorporated into an, as many meals as possible. And it's really quite, quite simple and can be done with almost any dietary strategy. So when someone inevitably is faced with a, a meal that's going to be toward the high end... A high glycemic meal. It's got. It's going to happen. You know, a, gr a great hack is you know have a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar before the meal. 
is there anything else one can do, whether it's, you know, load on more protein or a bit more fat or something we've talked about, like change the order of how you eat protein or, or fat first? Like, how do you think about like, it's going to happen? Maybe you're out to dinner, maybe it's a family meal or maybe it just it, it's going to happen. What are some things you could do in terms of changing the order of what you eat or potentially adding more of something to kind of minimize as best one can? There's so many strategies for lowering the glycemic impact of a meal that we can do when we're in these situations that uh, where it's very challenging to kind of control the situation. Like you mentioned, a really good one is vinegar. So vinegar has a measurable and well-studied effect on lowering blood sugar. And so if we are able to make sure there's a, a vinegar in the salad dressing we're eating at a, a meal... And or or maybe we do take a shot of apple cider vinegar mixed in water before we go out to dinner. That's a great little buffer, little little invisibility cloak uh, to do if you can remember. The thing that I really think about is like just fiber, protein and fat offset the glucose impact of a high carbohydrate, high glycemic meal. And I think they're especially valuable when you eat them in the first part of the meal so that you're really creating this like layer in the stomach and the gut that helps prevent the rapid absorption of whatever high glycemic thing you're going to be eating, whether it's like pasta or a sandwich or a dessert or something like that. So it's again, just thinking about like, what are your favorite fiber, protein and healthy fat sources? Um, and just getting a layer of those in the belly before you're putting in a lot of the, you know, refined grains or refined sugars, um, as a way to slow digestion and create a physical barrier to all that absorption. So that might look like if you know you're going to like a birthday party or whatnot, having a chicken breast or some ground beef or uh, some, you know, a couple hard boiled eggs before you go or making sure that you have a very high fiber snack with that food. So like flax crackers, seed crackers are one of my favorite ways to get a ton of fiber, but also like chia pudding can be wonderful with some coconut milk or almond milk or something like that, but preloading essentially. And then in terms of meal order, that gets into that a little bit as well, which is that when we can put, you know, some, some of that physical block to glucose absorption in the belly first in the beginning part of the meal, whether it's like a big fiber rich salad or protein or fiber, it's going to really help with the dynamics of how that glucose is absorbed into the body. So yeah, I think the key thing we don't want to we want to try and avoid is a lot of episodes of eating sort of these naked carbohydrates where it's just a carb going straight into the body with nothing else in there and this could be like, you know, essentially taking a carb predominant food like a piece of cake or a cookie or a banana and eating it on an em empty stomach routinely. So, you know, balancing those out with other factors. It can be really, really helpful. And then of course the key, take a walk after the meal. Like this is, this is like of everything I've learned. Right. Th that's an important one. Yeah. In five years of looking at tens of thousands of glucose data sets, literally like with levels and with the research for this book, I'm like, this is as close to the golden ticket to lowering blood sugar as I've ever seen. Like take a three, five, 10, 15 minute walk or do some air squats or have a dance party after a meal. And what that does is it activates all those big muscle groups in your body. And every time you literally take a step, you're contracting billions of myocytes of muscle cells and every single one of those muscle cells contracting, what that's going to do is physically push the glucose channels to the cell membrane to help take that glucose out of the bloodstream and put it through the mitochondria for energy. So a little bit of movement is powerful to sort of soak up and use glucose, but also as the energetic signal that pushes glucose channels to the cell membrane, and they'll stay there for a while after a meal. So you just want to make sure you're giving the body that, again, communication to do something that's going to help you. And you do that through muscle contraction, even if it's light. Yes, totally doable. Ha have have the vegetable, have the the protein before you have the bread or the pasta. And if you are having dessert, something have I found, opt for the dessert with has you know peanut butter, chocolate and peanut butter. A hell of a lot better than just having cake. You know, throw some. I always pick the dessert that has a 
a peanut, I'm a sucker for chocolate and peanut butter. And when I did levels, I found that chocolate and peanut butter was, I was totally fine. Had real no impact for me. Oh, absolutely. A favorite dessert in our household is a piece of dark chocolate with almond butter, peanut butter, nutso butter, with a little bit of flake salt on top. It's absolutely delicious and doesn't spike glucose. I love that. I love that tip. So we've covered a lot. Is there anything we didn't touch on that you want to touch on or leave our audience with before we before we close? Oh, my gosh. Well, I know we could talk all day, but <laughs> I think, you know, I will say, um, you know, when writing this book, my favorite chapter actually to write in the entire book was chapter nine, which is called Fearlessness, the Highest Level of Good Energy. And I think that what was so just overwhelming in writing a book about mitochondria and metabolic health was the incredible impact of our culture and the psychology of our culture and the nature of our very sort of fragmented culture. We're separated. We were socially isolated for a few years. We're spending a lot of time on our phones and how that is really negatively impacting our bi biology and how if we can really focus on doing some of the, you know, psychological work to help set some barriers with like just the constant sensationalist fear inducing media streams that are coming at us, like it has an, a strong impact on our biology. Because if you think about the body, it's, it's, it's sort of a zero sum game and where we can put our energy. And if, if we are constantly getting signals through our eyeballs, through our ears, that the world is like such a dangerous place because we just are having the fears and anxieties of 8 billion people literally streaming through a device in our hands, it is going to cause our bodies to divert energy towards threat response and defense instead of thriving and health and repair and happiness. And so I think, you know, a big a big theme that came through was like, we need to protect ourselves in some way from all these just like insane amount of information that's coming at us that really is causing, I think, this is a constant low grade stress in our body that our mitochondria respond to. There's literally a process called the cell danger response that's initiated by the mitochondria that can be activated through psychological fear that totally changes our mitochondrial dynamics. And so there's a, there's an element of um, setting boundaries with these these streams of information that is actually fundamentally key to our metabolic processes. And then additionally, the interaction in person with close, loving relationships and contacts is a signal that is it's something that our body actually needs to be able to produce the chemicals, like a literally like a little lab or pharmacy set that can really help our biology, things like oxytocin and serotonin. And so we we just we don't want to undervalue the importance of the psychological component of our metabolic health. And I think that we need to realize that like a lot of industries are really profiting of, off of our fear. Like if we are super fearful of the world and of death and of being around other people because of viruses, like that really turns us into like insatiable consumers of products or services that are going to quell our existential anxiety. And so I, I do think there's a deeper spiritual crisis that is kind of going hand in hand with our healthcare crisis, which is that there's a lot of industries, I think, helping to promote a sense of our own limitedness and weakness. And even I think entrenching in us that we're not actually capable of necessarily like taking control of our health that we actually really need to get past if we're going to reach our highest level of health. So that's, you know, I mean, and and I would say just like the 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 TLDR of that, the like too long didn't read is like the world is a scary place, but one of our fundamental jobs as humans is to create an environment within our body of safety. Because an environment of safety psychologically, which we can create through our minds and through being with other people that we trust and love, 
is foundational for our mitochondria to do their best work. Well, you know, beyond the platform, the big platforms and their role, and then then there's politics and the extremes of politics and how that plays out and how we're all kind of vulnerable to our own uh, algorithms and the content we consume. I would also add that many in our space have have done a disservice in that they've preached extremes, have doubled down on views that they don't necessarily really have, but it's part of their brand and have created a culture of fear around certain foods, diets. And it's sad because wellness has grown quite a bit, but we're getting, uh, or at least our category has grown quite a bit, but you know, the metabolic health numbers just keep on getting worse. So it's so true. I think there's, you know, you think about this, it's like the more we spend on healthcare, the sicker we're getting, the more research we do about food and nutrition, the sicker we're getting. The more the influencers get louder, the sicker we're getting. The more specialists we invent in healthcare, the sicker we're getting. So there is an intense need for us to actually move past all this noise and get back to trusting ourselves. And I think that can feel very scary. But the optimism here is that we live in this miraculous time where We have two things that are reality. One is we have the ability to understand how our health is doing with some basic biomarkers that all of us can understand. Things like the five key metabolic biomarkers. We can test those every three months for $99 and see how we're doing and whether our diet is working for us. And we know that symptoms are a gift that are telling us what's going on inside our bodies. And if we have symptoms, it means there's probably some fine tuning we need to do to improve our cellular biology. And through those two things, like we don't have to live in that state of tug of war between all these different messages. We can really understand for ourselves what's going on inside our own bodies. So I think that's actually, that's a new phenomenon. Just the last couple of years that we've really had access to these tools and technologies, plus all the traditional more body awareness, intuition to know that we really should take those seriously. And we actually don't have to be sort of a victim of this system that that's kind of benefiting off of our confusion. So yeah, I think it's an exciting time. And we just have to be really eyes open as we think about the system. And uh, I think a lot of the trust needs to come back to ourselves. We are the only species in the world with experts and PubMed and evidence-based medicine. And we're also the only species in the world with a chronic disease and obesity epidemic. So there's some element of this conversation that comes back to trusting ourselves and our miraculous internal body awareness that we have to know what's, what's right for us. So that's, that's a real message of the book is like, we have so much knowing and, uh, And we need to kind of push back against the distraction industrial complex that wants us to forget that uh, we are just incredible, limitless, you know, statistical near impossibilities uh, of, of individuals alive at this time in the world. And there's a lot of power in that. And we need to reclaim it. Well said, Casey. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jason. I want to take a moment to invite you into our mind, body, green ecosystem, where you can explore the infinite possibilities of health and well-being. All you have to do is click the subscribe button to hear more thought-provoking interviews with leaders in the health space. I am so grateful for all of you who have tuned in over the years, and let me tell you, it's only going to get better.